It's time for the VirginiaPreps.com podcast. Here's your host, Matthew Hatfield. And welcome to this latest edition of the VirginiaPreps.com podcast. Glad you are tuned in here as we have a lot to get to here. It's November now. We've got playoff football to chat about and also high school basketball right around the corner. A couple of guests tonight. we got Jamie Harless, head football coach of Lord Podtock Cavaliers as they get ready to embark on their postseason journey, as well as Radford head basketball coach Rick Cormany. His Bobcats lost in last year's state quarterfinals, but always a title contender. And we'll start things off with Coach Harless. Let's give it a listen to what he told us as they get ready for the Class 3 Region D postseason on the VirginiaPreps.com podcast. Back here on the VirginiaPreps.com podcast, I'm joined by a special guest. He is the head football coach of the Lord Botetot Cavaliers, another fine season regular season in the books for them. They finished up 8-2, and two, and uh, they've got a playoff game coming up in Class 3, Region D. Lord Botetot, the number two seed, playing host to the number seven seed, Christiansburg, as they begin their quest for a state title in the postseason. We say hello to our friend, Coach Jamie Harless. Coach, how you been? Doing fine, Matt. How are you doing? Not too bad. Good to have you here on the podcast. I think last week, chatted. we've exchanged a number of texts and emails throughout the course of the season. was uh, back in the summertime, and uh, I know you have that dreaded hex of, of Virginia Preps ranking you guys preseason number one, and it happened last year. Had a slew of injuries. Another good year. Uh, Run into a fine Stanton River team in the reg- regional final. Um, both of you teams played just two battles. And then this year, uh, preseason number one, get off to a good start. The injury bug comes again. Uh, you lose to Blacksburg by 10, rebound with a couple wins, lose to Northside by three, but you avenge that loss, beat Northside a second time, and we could see them chapter three with Lord Botetot and Northside, and you beat Bluefoot out of West Virginia, snapping their long winning streak. So now the regular season is done. Sort of put in, into words how you would describe how the year went for your team. Uh, the, the, the good, the good, the good description would probably be three or four roller coasters at Bush Gardens. Uh, <laughs> you know, it just it, a unique year. A lot of you know, a lot of different, um, a lot of different types of adversity kind of hit. Um, but you know, the, the the one thing about it that I, that I love about our kids, man, they are they are some fighters. I mean, regardless of who was on the field, it was uh, you know. Play, play their guts out for four quarters. You know, there wasn't a single game. You know, those two games we lost, we were leading in the fourth quarter. Uh, you know, fighting to the last second. You know, Blacksburg scored that 45th point with about a minute left. So, you know, the kids, we were within, we were within a field goal on both games with uh, under a minute left. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and offensively, I mean, you've had injuries on both sides of the ball, but still putting up a good amount of numbers in terms of yards and points. I think you finish up the regular season at 40.7 points per game, and you've been able to do what you do well, which I think the the staple or hallmark of your program is beginning in the weight room. You guys are known as a strong and physical football team, and your running game was on full display this past week, Coach, with 436 yards on the ground against William Fleming, who's an improving football team under uh, Coach Lovelace, new guy at the helm there, but uh, and Jamar Lovelace. Uh, but tell me this, uh, Evan Eller and Hunter Rice, that's a pretty lethal one-two punch, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's, it's you know, those are, they're, they're pretty good football players. And when you get those guys, it makes you, uh, makes you a whole lot better. Coach Evan actually had, I think, over 400 all-purpose yards Friday night in returns and Throwing the ball and running the ball, and um, I think Hunter. I think Hunter was over. Hunter was over 200 yards uh, rushing as well. I think some of the stats got mixed up for the game, but uh, yeah, the, the the thing about it is you got two skilled kids uh, like Hunter and Evan, and um, the O line and receivers. Um, one of the things going into this year that we were really pleased about was the kids' weight. Um, you don't want kids to go in. I, I don't like fat football players. Um, they don't need to look like their coach. Um, so we, we preach, you know, trying to keep the body fat low. But if a kid can be over 200 pounds as a skilled kid and have low body fat, that's uh, it's hard to deal with. And, you know, Evan is 205, Hunter's 215. Um, 
both of them can run extremely well and extremely powerful kids in the weight room. And um, with with O line being as strong as they are, and, um, I said you know we got receivers, you know bench power clean 250, 275 um, makes a difference. Indeed it does. We're chatting with Jamie Harless, head football coach of the Lord Botetot Cavaliers in the playoffs once again. And figured to be a tough out. It's the VirginiaPreps.com podcast as Lord Botetot, the number two seed, plays host to number seven seed Christiansburg uh, coming up on Friday. We'll get to that in just a bit, Coach. But uh, before, before we get back to uh, – Evan and Hunter, I want to touch on your offensive line. I know I joked with you and you said, oh, don't put the hex on me, Matt, with that. The offensive line, I feel like, is as strong and as sturdy as any in the state. And up front, like I mentioned, with the weight room, what you guys do with conditioning and strength and conditioning, it's it's a great trenches play. But, you know, you lose a Noah Overstreet who was a four-year starter, an all-state kid, multiple years, and you wonder, oh, goodness, how are we going to be up front? But you got some great football players led by Jesse Hansen, the Virginia Tech commit. You also have Colston Powers, a young talent, as well as a Mead Mayo. Uh, speak on those guys up front and just how valuable they are to what you do, both offensively and defensively. You know, uh, the, the group from last year, you know, we lost. We ended up losing, you know, two starting tight ends. Uh, starting guard, starting center, and um, our, uh, we ended up moving Colston into a starting role at offensive tackle. You know, early in the year he was, you know, going through some uh, growing pains, and he has just absolutely improved a ton over the course of the year. You know, the rest of the kids uh, on the O line: Justin Young, Ryan Dowdy, uh, Meet Mayo, Jesse. Um, Drew Wiley, we call him Coach Wiley. Uh, Drew was uh, Drew was extremely intelligent. He could play anywhere from tight end to center. I mean, he he can do it all. <laughs> We've actually put him in the backfield, played a little fullback this year too because of an injury to our starting fullback, and we actually will be getting him back next week. He got hurt up at Western Alabama. Big kid, five eleven, two twenty five. Brett Meacham. Mm-hmm. Uh, looking forward to getting him back. Um, but, you know, they what they've really done and uh, what's been impressive is to watch them on film, how well they're communicating now. You know, sometimes, um, you know, O-linemen make a mistake and they assume that each other knows, you know, what, what stack they're blocking in a particular play or, you know, what the responsibilities are. Now you see them pointing and talking and uh, communicating really well. I'm very pleased with that uh, Friday night didn't have any gross errors at all uh, as far as blocking that I could see. Um, just really starting to come together as a, as a group, which is very, very good at this time of year. It is, and we'll get into your matchup and the regional outlook as well as state here in just a second. But uh, as you know, people are always into the recruiting thing of uh, side of things when it comes to the football prospects, and you got one already committed to Virginia Tech in uh, Jesse Hansen there. And uh, we know that Hunter Rice has already gotten a lot of attention as a sophomore. Give us sort of an update on the sort of the, the rundown with some of these players, uh, including your seniors too. And you got an impressive group of seniors coming up here with uh, uh, Deweese and Mayo and others. That uh, what's it looking like for them on the college front? What schools have been coming through, and who's looking at some of these guys? Um, you know, Deweese has really kind of got his um, mindset on going to Washington Lee. He's okay. uh, Jake is a really intelligent kid, uh, had a you know really high SAT score, really astronomical GPA. You know, he, he, he definitely wants to look at that route, but you know, I think VMI is interested in him. UVA's uh, said he has a walk-on opportunity there if he wants it. Um, Mead Mayo, uh, Mead's been offered by Concord and St. Andrews. Um, so, you know, Mead, you know, don't know what's going to end up happening with him. He's he's done a really good job this year. Uh, obviously, Jesse's going to Tech. Um, Preston Martin, he has a, a scholarship to St. Andrews as well down in North Carolina. Um, he's trying to determine whether he wants to continue to play or not. Um, Drew Wiley is going to be a probably a blue chip Division three guy. Um, and Trey, Trey Rice, is uh, he's as good a kicker as I've ever coached. Um, uh, eight or nine on field goals, the one, you know, the one that he didn't make got blocked. Um, <laughs> broke the school record, kicked a 50-yard field goal. Um, the 
Young Bucks, Hunter, um, obviously UVA, and things are starting to pick up with him. A lot of people snooping around, asking questions. Um, Colston, I think, will be some something similar to Jesse. Uh, if he keeps working at it, and like I said, this, with the, the pace that he's come along in his development has been really, really pleasing. Um, but I, man, I'm telling you that uh, I, I think uh, Evan Eller is uh, – Somebody better get on that one, buddy, because he is, man, he's Mr. Football. He is, his skill set is just absolutely fantastic, and he hits like a, he hits like a truck. And yeah. he is athletic, intelligent, um, Sam Rogers type guy that can just do everything. That's a great comparison with the Sam Rogers. They're a high praise there, and you're right, he seems like the versatile, under the radar guy for you, coach, uh, speaking with. Jamie Harless, head football coach at Lord Botetourt Cavaliers, going to the playoffs at eight and two as they get ready to host Christiansburg here on the VirginiaPreps.com podcast. And how crucial is special teams? We pay attention to those strong guys up front, and you got some some talented, skill guys on the back end, the backs with with Hunter, what he's done. But you've had some close games, and we people are anticipating maybe a chapter through with Northside. You've had two classics that went under the wire with them already. You got Trey Rice kicking field goals. I believe Deweese had a return of a block punt of the night. Eller's a kickoff return a threat every time out there for you. I believe he had an 85-yarder against Fleming. How crucial is special teams going to be for you on this journey as you try to win a region state title? Because it seems like at, there's going to be some point, maybe around Turkey Day or perhaps beyond, that it's going to come down to a kick or a punt or a big return. You know, you go back to, uh, you know, some of our previous playoff games. Um, you know, we had a we had a 4th and 13 uh, against Monticello couple years ago we faked that thing and got it you know we're we i don't mind i i make this statement all the time you can't play with scared money you know mm-hmm. talking about the betting game I, i'm not gonna I, I didn't come to lose you know if i if i gotta roll the dice i'm gonna roll the dice we faked the punt uh against north side and got a crucial first down uh that's like that last game and uh you know if, if we got a fake we're gonna take it we, we don't necessarily care about the distance unless it's just so far out of reach that we don't feel like we can, you know, get the yardage. But, uh, and I don't, I don't mind. I'm gonna, if, if the field goal is 55 yards or in, we're going to take it. We'll onside kick at a moment's notice. Uh, I think, I think doing that and, you know, having that threat in the game can really, uh, you know, can really mess with, uh, can really mess with the other team's psyche, um, and I and I think it, it shows your kids you got confidence in them that you believe in them that they can do those type of things. Uh, very true. We uh, Coach Young and I on our, on our high school sports talk plus video show the other day talked about how potentially the state finals could be whoever wins Region A and Region D. Not to knock the other very good football teams in Class Three, but we were anticipating some. Rematch collision courses in the Tywater Richmond area. Phoebus and Hopewell played a seven six game last year. They're one and two seeds, and you guys in Northside both one and two seeds. You've played two classics already this year. But give me how you guys, as a coaching staff, keep the kids in tune. To, you have Christiansburg coming up, sort of nothing to lose. Lucy Goosey team coming in, who did some decent things against Blackpool. They lost that game in the regular season finale. Uh, Abingdon at eight and two is no slouch. They've beaten a couple of quality class two teams in, in the past month with the likes of Union and Ridgeview. Magna Vista, though the record says five and five, we know about Coach Favero and their history of playing in big games and winning multiple state titles. So what's your sense of the region? What do you guys as a staff do to keep them locked in and focused on the task at hand? Well, the, the biggest thing is is understanding that you lose, you're done. You know, the, you're, you're only guaranteed that week. Um, you, know, the, you know, I always tell them when it's playoffs, this might be the last Monday practice you have. You better make it your best. It's the last Tuesday. You just don't know. Uh you got you got to preach a constant reminder that hey this could be it doesn't matter who you're playing doesn't matter what the record is the to, to me um, and I've had multiple conversations with other coaches about this is that the regular season is nothing but a preparatory phase now um, you want to play the games you need to play to prepare yourself for, for the playoffs um, you know put yourself in a schedule and put yourself in a run of games that are very difficult so you can expose yourself week 
weaknesses and be, be prepared and ready to play. And, uh, you know, I've already told them. I told them on Friday night we did not – I don't think we performed as well as we could have against William Fleming. They got, they got some talented kids, uh, and, you know, credit to them. They did a nice job of having a good game plan and what they needed to do to, to give us some problems. But in the same breath, I told them, I said, you know, you can contribute to that by playing with bad technique. And then I told them myself, I said, I, I did a very poor job of preparing you guys on a short week, and I learned a lot from that. Uh, I said, but, you know, you got to know that those kids, they're not going to show up and say, hey, you know, hey, you're Lord Bata. Well, we're gonna, you're going to beat our brains out. They're coming to win, and you better fight hard. Or if you don't, they're going to take it from you. So, I mean, we talk about that all the time, but you, you got to stay at a high level of focus, and you got to remember that it, the battle is never the other team. The battle is, is can you execute to a level that is good enough to beat whoever you play? And that's why I think you got to have some really tough games during the regular season so you understand what that level has to be. And you got to remind them of that, that if you don't play at this level every week in the playoffs, you'll go home. So having those really tough games is what really gets you ready. That's the preparatory phase. You know, Christiansburg comes in there. You know, going into this that Bluefield game, everybody told me they were, you know, like a small college. And I'll be honest with you, they were. They were huge. They were fast, uh, athletic everywhere. And I told the kids, I said, if you don't go over here and play hard, you're going to get your brains beat in. And our execution level at that game was just, it was phenomenal. And that's what we want to work to, you know, every week we play. And I think that's what you got to do if you want to advance in the playoffs. For sure, and you got that one over Bluefield 17-3. to I'll get you out on this one, Coach, and I appreciate your time immensely. Uh, a few years ago, you were close to a state championship loss to Magna Vista in the title game. You've been knocking on that door. What's different about this team? I mean, I get the feeling that the injuries, you're healthier than you've been the last couple of years being so close to it, knocking on the door. And what's it going to be, what's it going to take besides some of the things you've already outlined in terms of finishing off the deal? Because there's a lot of good teams that could be sitting in the way and some obstacles that come your way you're not anticipating perhaps uh, through this journey. And what's it going to take for you guys to get that state championship in December? Well, we just, we just got to, we just got to be. And, 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 you know, if we're fortunate enough to win enough games to even have a chance playing that game, I, I, that, that's great. But I, I think for us, for Northside, for Christiansburg, Magna Vista, for anybody, any, any of those remaining 32 teams, that every week you better prepare like it's your last game. You better play like it's your last game. When the kids are on the field, they better play like it's their last snap every snap. And if you can, and, and, and honestly, if, if the kids can maintain that level of intensity and, and they can fight so hard that they believe they can win every snap, that's what's going to get you there. But if you allow fatigue, lack of focus, or just, just the lack of desire, you're, you're going to lose. And I mean, it might be that you play 99% of the snaps as good as you can play them. It's only going to take one percent to lose. I mean, it's it's got to be that type of level of focus. It's got to be that belief and playing that hard the entire game. That's that's really what a championship team is made of. Now, this doesn't necessarily always mean that you're the most talented or you have the fastest or the strongest kids because you see it happen all the time. Teams get upset uh, that shouldn't be upset, but they get upset because. They didn't play as hard as another team that maybe wasn't as talented. And I think that's the answer uh, for any of the teams that are left. Uh, very true there. And that's the coach of the Laura Botox Cavaliers, Jamie Harless, with us here on the VirginiaPreps.com podcast. His squad begins their playoff journey of trying to win five wins coming up on Friday when they play host to Christiansburg. Coach, best wishes to you here in the postseason. I'm sure we'll chat soon. Yes, sir. Appreciate it. That's Coach Jamie Harless with us here on the VirginiaPreps.com podcast here as Lord Botatop plays host to Christiansburg on Friday. 
So there you have it. We thank Coach Harless of Lord Botetai for giving us some time. We now shift gears from football to basketball. We'll get back to football in a little bit with my playoff predictions, but got a chance to catch up with Coach Rick Cormany of the Radford Bobcats as they opened up practice and look to embark on their journey of pursuing a state championship in 2018-19. Let's hear what Coach Cormany told us about his squad, Quentin Morton Robertson, Miles Jones, and others on the VirginiaPreps.com podcast. At this time on the VirginiaPreps.com podcast, basketball season is almost here as we've moved into November, and we're joined by a special guest. He is the head basketball coach of one of the state's premier programs. We're talking about the Radford Bobcats, who have gone incredible 131-13 and over the past five seasons. They've got five state titles since 2009. They've got a couple of Division I prospects and a young pup to watch out for too on that squad and the coach of the Bobcats is he's approaching 700 wins he's at 662 in his storied career and we're talking about coach Rick Cormany coach how you been I'm doing good wow I didn't know all that <laughs> but yeah I'm doing good yeah you're closing in on 700 I'll get to that but uh let's chat about last year you guys were going for a three-peat and of course making that transition from class one where you won back-to-back state titles uh beating the likes of Lancaster and George Wythe out of Withville, and you know Pat Burns real well, a good friend of yours, having a storied history with him. Uh, moving to Class 2, and it was just loaded in Class 2 last year. Even the teams that didn't win it, you look at the likes of Graham and Dan River and uh, Union and so many others, Martinsville's got a tradition. And you ran into a team at 27-0 and in the state quarters, Gate City, with Mac McClung and Zach Irvin, and you lost that in front of a packed house there to finish 27-1. Sort of put a bow on last year if you can, and um, coming up short of a state championship, but you still had a great year at 27 and one. Uh, yeah, it was. You know, they were just better than us at night, and it's. Uh, you know, believe it or not, man, we've gotten to the point where now it's just like it felt like a. You know, the season felt like a failure. I mean, uh, in a lot of ways, I don't know. We've just gotten. Uh, you know, the expectations are so high, and that's a good thing. That's a real good thing. But uh, you know, they were. They were uh, really good that night. I thought they were just tougher than us in a lot of ways, and I underestimated. It felt like I did a terrible job coaching that night, and underestimated some of their guys that weren't. Uh, you know, you know, everybody was talking about McClung and uh, Irvin, and you know, we kind of underestimated the other guys, and they did a great job. And uh, you know, just uh, just a bad night for us, actually. Well, I think you caught them, too, at, at the bad time, and you guys were undefeated with that bullseye. And, you know, in class, too, there were so many good teams, as I mentioned. Robert E. Lee had the, the Jarvis Vaughn kid, and uh, Graham with Darren Martin, I think, was a team that kind of got, you know, maybe not the notoriety they deserved to be in 23-2 and two going to the States. And they were coming off that loss uh, to Graham in the region championship, and I think had things been reversed, had you guys may have had a loss or two and then been undefeated, it could have worked to your favor. It's just one of those things where – you catch a team on a certain night, and, and class two is, I think people forget about it because obviously you know this being a, a coaching veteran, class six and class five get a lot of the limelight, but there's some really good basketball and some great, you know, tacticians on the benches there, yourself included, at the class two and class one levels. Yeah, exactly, but you know, the thing the thing is, uh, you know, you're exactly right about it. Sometimes there, there is, I know everybody says it, but there is such a thing as a is a good loss. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's hard for me to even even say that, but there is such a thing as that. And you know, the year before that, when we when we did win the state championship, we lost to Northside late in the season, That's right. and they just waxed us. I mean, they could have named the score. And I think, yeah, you know, I think we were like on a fourteen game winning streak at that time. And you know, I think it just woke us up. I think it just really drove us and made us realize that hey, you know what we're really not as good as we think we are and uh, but I you know at, at the same time I just think that uh, Gate City last year had some veteran kids that had some toughness and they had been denied so many times and so you know we we played them in major games like three times uh, mm-hmm. and I think they were just so hungry and I think we underestimated how hungry they really were. Yeah, McClung stepped up on the big stage, the Georgetown Hoyer Garden. Zach Irvin, as people know, uh, he's made his college choice 
heading to Wofford. But let's turn the page now to this year, 2018-19 campaign coming up. And I've seen some of these faces for, for quite a while now. Quentin Morton Robertson, who's grown to about 5'8". I think he walked in the door at 5'5 five, five or 5'6", five, but a three-time player of the year um, in the region a couple times player of the year. He's been a state player of the year, started on a couple state championship teams. He's accepted a full scholarship to play at Radford University, not far from home. And then Miles Jones, 6'6", six, six forward for you. was hurt a little bit last year, but we saw the promise as a freshman and as a 10th grader. He's also going to Radford University to play for his dad. Two special young men for you. Oh, exactly. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, Quinn Morton Robinson. Oh my goodness. You know, I can I can go on and on and on. And and uh, you know, I, I was thinking coming home as I was driving home. Got about a twenty minute drive home. I was thinking about you know the small guards that have been really really good at, even at the at the top level. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, I just can see this this guy. You know, he's just, I mean, he's just so, so competitive. And I think really sometimes people underestimate how good he is and, and until you get out there with him. And I think when he gets really good players, I mean, he's got good players in high school, but when he gets players around him that can really finish and score and transition. And plus the thing is, I, I've not seen anybody stop him in transition. And uh, whether it's a pull-up, he can, he finds ways to get his shot. Uh, and one of the hardest-working kids I've ever coached and practiced daily. I mean, it's not just – it's it's almost like a chip-on-his-shoulder kind of work ethic. And then, you know, talking about Miles Jones, I I think his his uh, window of, uh, of improvement, you know, I think he's just barely scratching the surface. I think he's going to really – uh, as he moves on through college, so, you know he's got he passes the eye test for sure. He's stronger this year. Last year he got hurt late in the season. He had a hyper hyper extended his knee, and and I you know not making excuses of how he played late, but he he never was quite himself after that. Didn't get in, back in great shape. I, I look for him to have an outstanding season. Yeah, I want to touch on uh, Miles in a second as well as some other players for you. But going back to Mort Robertson, Coach, uh, it, unflappable is the word that came to mind watching him the last couple of years in the state playoffs. I mean, his demeanor doesn't really change, but he he has still that intense yeah. and competitive edge about him. And, you know, one of the point guards in the state that can really control the game, whether he's scoring or dishing, right? Oh, exactly. And I'm glad you brought that up. That, that is so true. I mean, what I mean, it, it's like nothing ever rattles him, and I and I've had you know opposing coaches and rivals and everything just say, you know what, you know they they try a lot of different things and and some yeah, some things work, but it still doesn't rattle him. You know he still kind of makes sure he just stays even keel and uh, uh, incredible quality for a point guard uh, and just such a humble young man. But when he gets on the floor, he's got a tiger in his tank, and and that's uh, hates to lose. Uh, you know, after this loss to Gate City, uh, probably the whole next week. You know, I'm hearing stories about 6 a.m. in the morning, being at the rec center. That's that's who he is. Uh, he's getting up shots, and he's getting better. Chatting with Rick Cormany, he's the head basketball coach of the Radford Bobcats, one of the staples when it comes to playoff basketball in Virginia High School League. Hoops 662 victories to his credit, five state titles going back to his days even before Radford at Rocky Gap in Grayson County. Our guest on the VirginiaPreps.com podcast as the Bobcats start things off with a benefit game November the 20th against Cave Spring and then their season opener coming up on uh, December the 13th, a Thursday night against Floyd County as uh, Coach Brian Harmon's Buffaloes always give people a battle. Coach, uh, looking at Miles before I move on to some other guys on your team and sort of an outlook on the hoop scene in your area. Uh, you know, Miles, younger brother of Nate Jones, who went on to Bucknell. We mentioned the dad there. Uh, much like, you know, Quentin we saw when Q was a freshman, you know, the Division One talent was there. The people questioned the size. Miles has got the size. How's this game going to evolve? And with Nate going to Bucknell, you wondered, will the younger brother end up playing for his dad or elsewhere? He's going to go play for his dad. We knew he had ability to play scholarship Division One, Division Two, you know, whatever level of conference it be. But uh, how surprised are you that he's going to go play for his dad now at the next level? And what do you see him doing for them? Uh, not so much surprised because you know part of that was you know Miles. Miles, I think, wants to coach, and and I think that he's always you know Nate really didn't care too much about 
dad is a profession. He's smarter <laughs> than the rest of us. Okay. But anyway, uh, but Miles has been that kid, I think, for them that really uh, wanted to be around it and, and he's around it all the time. Uh, I've been to a couple practices and he's down there on the bench, uh, you know, uh, watching or or even just being a part of it, and that's been going on for a long time. I think part of that is just wanting to go into the coaching profession, too. And um, not to mention, I really do believe that, uh, you know, Miles is best basketball a couple years away. I mean, I think that as he continues to, uh, when you see him, uh, when you see him the next time, you're going to say, wow. I mean, because he's been very committed to the weight room in the off season. He's stronger. He's uh, you know he's playing well above the rim. He, you know, he's a legit six six. And you know at that level, I think sometimes it's better to find a four or five guy that can that can do more things like press and uh, you know play on the ball and, and guard different positions than it is to get that six nine kid that might not be quite as versatile. Well, tell me, makes sense. tell me if I'm wrong. No, it does make sense. Tell me if I'm wrong. I kind of felt like Nate was the more polished player earlier, but the upside could be greater with Miles also being bigger, different position than Nate. Fair to say at this kind of the same stages in comparison, or no? I think you're exactly right. Yeah, and now now Nate's work work ethic, especially early, mm-hmm. uh, and and still, I mean, really, still is the, this day. Nate Nate is more that perimeter guy that. That, uh, but he could play multiple zi- positions. I had to play him at points up uh, back when Finley got hurt, uh, you know, during some of those runs. But, uh, but you know, I think once Miles really gets on campus and gets committed to the game 24-7, uh, I, think, uh, I think the ceiling is, uh, you know, pretty high for him. A few more minutes with Rick Cormany, head basketball coach of the Radford Bobcats, our guest here on the VirginiaPreps.com podcast as the 2018-19 campaign. Just a couple weeks away. It'll be here before you know it. We'll start our top ten countdown soon. And we always know Radford's up there either one, two, or three, it seems like, every year. And we talk about dads coaching their sons. Mike Jones, a fine coach at Radford University, get a chance to coach his son, Miles, next year. Of course, you want to win over state town before you do that. And you've got your son trying to win a state championship with him. And uh, Cam Cormany, tell me about him. 5'11", sophomore guard, over 11 points per game as a freshman. And he can shoot the three ball, can he not? Uh, he can shoot a little bit. <laughs> he, he spends a lot of time in the gym. He's, he's that ultimate gym rat. But, uh, you know, I don't know if I'm passing that test yet. I mean, I don't. I think I probably failed that test of Coach Mom, uh pretty bad last year. It, I didn't realize how hard. It, and I talked to Mike Jones about it. I said, Coach, you don't realize. I mean, because you just find yourself nitpicking and just not really. You know, it's hard not to watch all the wrong things they do. And you know, it's. You know, it's uh, it's one of the hardest things I've ever had to do. I mean, it, I've been doing this thing for a long, long time. And to, uh, not that it's not enjoyable, not sure it's enjoyable for the wife, but uh, <laughs> just don't know if I'm, I, I'm not sure I'm passing on this one. I think I might be getting an F on this. Well, you got time to get it fixed. But I remember even at some of your previous state championships back when you had some of those guys like Nate Jones and Finley and others that you could see that little youngster on the bench there, ball boy, was always around basketball. So I imagine he's grown up around it, and he took real quickly to the guys and what you guys do offensively, defensively. Uh, you're exactly right. They've, uh, you know, I've got another one too. He's 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 on the eighth grade team. Uh oh. Uh oh yeah. <laughs> and they have uh, the one the funny quick story in 2009 when we finally broke the uh, broke the door down and won our first state title. Uh, that team Cam was probably my Cam was probably about six or seven, but uh, I kicked them out of the gym in one practice and ran them out as mad as I could be. And of course Cam was up there, and next thing you know, I hear this about five years later from the guys on that 2019. Uh, Next thing you know, Cam goes by. He's a little guy. He's six or seven. He goes by the locker room, stomps his foot, and says, "What are y'all doing? I mean, I can't believe y'all. Y'all need to be better than this." So he's coaching them up. Well, I come to find out, they jerked him in that little locker room, and it, you have to see the place. It, it's uh, jerked him in there, turned the lights out, and and gave him what put what for and scared him real good, Jeez. and made sure that uh, he never told told me. 
And uh, to this day, he has never told me. I mean, they finally told me, you know, five, five to ten years later. <laughs> Poor kid's probably traumatized over it. Oh boy, that's and something else. That's just part of being being around being around it all the time. I tell the wife all the time, "There's worse places to raise a kid." There are, and uh, you, there's always lessons learned in sports that are positives that can help you in life beyond the court, which I'm sure we will talk about in future conversations and on the podcast. But, Coach, uh, you guys play a good schedule. I see you're playing Dudley this year at Roanoke College. you got the likes of Giles and Northside, who's going to be a contender for the Class 3 crown, and we mentioned Floyd County early on. But the thing that struck struck me uh, looking at your survey that you, you sent in as we're passing them out to all the coaches around the state is that and I kind of forgotten about this that you know twenty seven and one you lose in the state quarters it's almost like what's wrong with Radford they didn't win it this year sort of a disappointment from some people's perspective but you did that with no seniors on the team so uh oh these guys could be even better this year if they buy in and they continue to get better yeah it's pretty amazing uh, and I guess it just feels like that Miles and Q and and some of these guys have been around forever and. Uh, there's several that contribute. I mean, you got uh, Jalen Phillips, Thor Sproul, these seniors, this, this outstanding group of seniors that uh, have just done everything we've asked. And, and I'll be honest with you, this is probably the hardest they've worked in the offseason. I think that was a – and you can imagine, you know, we're at home, we're at the Deadman Center, place is packed, and uh, that one that one kicked us in the gut now. It, uh, it's uh, – uh, it's left a very sour taste in their mouth, and 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 these kids are pretty. You know, but it doesn't mean that you know, I have to tell them all the time. You can't judge each season on whether you're state champions or not. You gotta, you know, you got to, uh, you know, you, I, a lot of times, and that's that's the standard. But you know, that was a great season, but none of us feel like it was a great season because of how it ended. And that's you know, it's a lot of pressure, but. I think uh, with Q's leadership and the way he's been in the gym, uh, you know, it's it's like he and my son are like, okay, uh, they're just calling each other out when they're not in the gym. If that makes sense, it's like, yeah. you, uh, you know, uh, you mean you're not in the gym? And that's the way it's gone since since the week we lost. Yeah, and you, you've seen it in the past, and um, we could talk about this all night in terms of just – the fact that these teams that have been right there and they've won it before, gotten close, Westfield with that Tyler Scanlon group and Colonial Forge and L.C. Bird and Potomac at some of the higher levels. I mean, you watch Lancaster who fell into you guys and they broke it down last year. These teams that have those, t- those squads with juniors and sophomores and they have a chance to get back, they usually find a way to get back and get better. And you've got those focused and motivated guys to certainly have an opportunity come March, which it is still, hey, we're still talking about four or five, six months away from getting to that goal at the Seagull Center. But give me a sense of, of the landscape out there and then the teams this year. You guys will be in the hunt and um, some of the other teams that we could keep an eye on for uh, either in your region, your district, and just the area in general. What do you think of the season coming up for uh, basketball out there? Well, I think, you know, as always, it's always tough and, you, and you've and got to, uh, you know, I look for pe- people think Gate City, Gate City's going to be good again. I mean, yes. you, uh, Zach Irvin is one heck of a player. In fact, he hurt us more in that game. Uh, than Matt McClung and you know and Mike Young at Walford. Uh, I've talked to him about this kid, and I'm like, you got to get this kid. He is really good. It's crazy, Coach. He could actually be, and people take this as a knock on McClung, and it's not. He could actually end up being a better college player than McClung, and that's no slight towards McClung. He's going to he's at Georgetown now, but Irvin could actually have a chance to break some records that McClung set and be the better player when it's all said and done. I, I agree, and 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 we couldn't guard him. I mean, he was just his toughness, and he's going to bring guys with him because they've been there now. You know, mm-hmm. he, they've done, been there and done that, and he's going to bring a bunch of guys with him uh, uh, through the off season. They're going to want to do it again. You know, we know all about that. So I just think that you know we're still going to have to get through the likes of those kind of guys. I think Graham. You know, by beating them last year, you know, if we, I think they're going to be a challenge. I mean, they they play hard, they play the right way. They're they're extremely, you know, they're going to be coached the same kind of way, even though uh, uh, Coach Colorado's gone. I mean, I just think that uh, it's going to be as hard as ever. I think Martinsville is always going to be there, regardless of what people think they have, because they're just going to do what they do, and you got to figure out a way to 
to deal with it. So I don't expect it to be any easier than it's ever been, you know, if that's, uh, um, if that makes sense. I mean, it's just the way it is. Yeah, you're in a meat grinder of a division with the likes of Graham and Dan River and Martinsville and Gate City and the Radford Bobcats plan to be in that mixture as we get around playoff time in February and into March. Uh, Coach Rick Cormany of the Bobcats closing in on win number 700 in his illustrious career, trying to win a sixth state title since 2009. A pleasure talking with you, and I'm sure we'll be in touch. Hey, man, it's great to, great to hear from you and great doing this with you, Bob. I appreciate what you do. It's always good to catch up with you. Absolutely. That is Rick Cormany, head basketball coach of the Radford Bobcats, our guest here on the VirginiaPreps.com podcast. They get things going with the benefit game against Cave Spring November the 20th and their opener December the 13th against Floyd County at Radford High. All right, back here on the VirginiaPreps.com podcast. Matt Hatfield with you and the playoffs. Playoffs! are finally here. 2018's high school football postseason ready to get cranked up. And we're here with that magnificent seven music in the background to give you a little feel for the playoffs. My predictions sure to go wrong. We hope they go right, but I really don't care if they're right or wrong. We just do it for fun and laughs and all that good stuff. Let's go through them. Start from the lower division, class one, to the higher division, class six. We generally go the other way around. Starting from 6 on a 1. We'll give the little guys some love. And let's do that beginning with Region 1A. Franklin's the top seed at 9 and 1, hosting the number 8 seed, Washington and Lee. And boy, not the year I thought WNL would have. I had them in the preseason top 10. They have weapons with JJ McNeil, wide receiver. But man, tough matchup here with Franklin. Even without Jalen Ford, who's out with the injury, the Wake Forest commit. Broncos roll. No 1 8 upset. Could be a little scary, a little tight. For a half there as Franklin had a tight one to close up the regular season against Southampton. Number two seed Northumberland on the other side of the bracket at 9-1. And, and the number seven seed Colonial Beach at 6-4. and four. This is a dangerous game. A tricky one. One that has a little upset potential there with the drifters of Colonial Beach. But I'm going to stick with the Indians. They get the nod. No 7-2 upset. But this is one that has more potential than others for the seven to knock off the two. What else is going to happen in Class 1 Region A? I'm going to give you Rappahannock at 7-3 and three to knock off the number 6 seed, West Point at 7-3 and three in a tight one. Essex, the number 4 seed at 7-3 and three to beat Northampton, the number 5 seed. I've got in the Region Championship, Essex, the 4 seed. Yes, the 4 seed, Essex, taking down Northumberland, the number 2 seed to win the region title in 1A. Moving on to 1B. we got to speed things up here with limited time on this edition of the podcast. They get it right. They go six seeds. Riverhead's got the one. they got a bye. So does William Campbell with the two seed at six and four. They'll meet in the region championship, and Riverhead's will win it. But we will go with Central Lindenberg to beat Winless Cumberland and Alta Vista to defeat Winless Stonewall Jackson in the quarterfinal games. No shockers there. Over in 1C. Galax, the top seed, will take down Eastern Montgomery. No problems there. Narrows coming off a loss at 8-2. The number two seed will beat Auburn 5-5. Five five. I got Perry McClure, the three seed, knocking out the six seed, Bath County. And in the 4-5 game, George with the four at 6-4. and four. Covington, the five at 7-3. I'm going to go with Covington, the five, to get the win. What happens in the region final? Narrows coming off that tight loss to Perry McClure. I think they get revenge in the semis. But I'm going with Galax, Mark Dixon's maroon tie to win the regional crown in 1C. In 1D, Chilhowee, the number one seed, 10-0. and 0. They'll take out 4-6 and six east side, the eighth seed. Number two seed, Patrick Henry Glade Spring at 9-1. and one. They'll beat Honeaker, the seventh seed, at 5-5 five and five overall. I got J.I. Burton, the three, eliminating the six, Holston. And Grundy, the four, escaping against the five, Thomas Walker with my man, Mr. Pfizer, running the ball. I think Grundy will give Chilhowee a little bit of a tussle for a half. But ultimately, when push comes to shove, Chilhowee and Patrick Henry Glade Spring, the Rebels and the Warriors, will meet up again. They were both 8-0 when they played the first time. Chilhowee doubled them up, and Chilhowee will win again. Close to the same margin. Chilhowee, your Region 1D champs. Moving on to Class 2. For the playoffs in high school football here on the VirginiaPreps.com podcast. Region 2A. 
The favorites certainly looking to be the likes of Goochland, Amelia, and Pocosin, your top three seeds. And I see a lot of chalk. Goochland undefeated will take out the eight seed, three and seven Brunswick. In the four five game, I got King William squeaking by the five seed Greensville County. Pocos in the three will not have much trouble with uh, the six not away. And Amelia, the two, will take out Arcadia at five and five, the seven seed. Gives us a Pocos and Amelia second round matchup. And I got the Islanders, the Bull Islanders, Elliot Duty's team getting the win there. Goochland gets it through against gets through against King William in the second round. And in the region final, Goochland exacting revenge for last year's loss to Pocosin. The Bulldogs stay unbeaten and get to the state semis at 13-0 overall. 2B, I got East Rockingham undefeated, beating the 8-seed Wilson Memorial Shenandoah District Offensive Player of the Year. Jawan Evans, he's too much for Wilson Memorial. Central Woodstock, the 2. Strasburg, the 7. Give me Central Woodstock to win there. Luray, the 3 at 7-3. Lee Stanton, the 6 at 6-4. Six Give me the Fighting Lehman. It's your almost team to get the win. Upset special there with Lee. And then the 4-5 game, Clark County Buffalo Gap. That has overtime written all over it. Give me Clark County with the win. Region final, who wins? East Rockingham beating Central Woodstock, my preseason number one team, right after Turkey Day. East Rock gets it done. In Region 2C, Radford's the one seed at 9-1. and one, Fresh off that big win over Glenver, the two seed. Give me Radford over Fort Chiswell, who's 5-5, five and five, the eight seed. In the 4-5 game, Gretna and James River. Gretna Hawks, victorious, got a lot of firepower on offense. The two seed, Glenver, 9-1 against Buckingham County at 6-4, the seven seed. Glenver moves on. Coach Clifford's team gets the nod. And in a 3-6 game, Appomattox, the defending three-time state champs, they beat Giles. I think Appomattox-Glenver could be your region final caliber game in the second round. Appomattox gets the win. Radford, Appomattox in the region final. And despite the emergence of P.J. Prelu, son of the former NFL defensive back Pearson Prelu, I've got Appomattox with the freshman quarterback and Trey Lawing winning Region 2C. Moving down to 2D, we got Ridgeview, the one seed, knocking out the eight seed Central Wise. In the 4-5 game, it's Grayson County at 8-2. Richland's at 6-4, the five seed. They're going to play for their Fallen, former Richland standout, Devin Johnson. The unfortunate passing earlier this week. Uh, college football player at Marshall at once started at Richland's. Richland's, the Blue Tornado, they will get it done. Moving on to the next round, but I don't think they can take down Richland in the second round. Union takes out John Battle in the 2-7 game, and Graham eliminates Virginia High in the 3-6 matchup. Gives you an interesting Graham-Union second round battle. When all is said and done, I've got the Purdue commit Cam Allen and Graham taking out the program on the rise in Ridgeview led by Trenton Atkins and Matthew Sexton. Give me Graham the three seed to win the region title. So a couple of three seeds there for you in Graham and Appomattox in Class 2. And before we pause for a reset for 4, 5, and 6, let's give you what we got for Class Three in high school football's postseason regional picks. We're going to wait for state championship picks, folks. We might do that when the second round commences in our next podcast. Moving on to Region 3A. This is a tough one to call. You got Phoebus, Hopewell, Norcom, the top three seeds. I think Phoebus bounces out. New Kent, the eight seed. Hopewell, the 2 7 matchup with Petersburg. Give me the Blue Devils, Ricky Irby's team. They got their swagger back. Defense played great against Dimity not too long ago. As they bounce back from that overtime loss to Thomas Dale. Norcom lost to Booker T, the sixth seed in regular season. They won't do it this time at home in Portsmouth. Give me the Greyhounds with the ODU commit Kaysan, Dixon, Torres Jones, and company. DeMonte Dunlap running well for them. And in the 4-5 game, Doug Pereira's York Falcons. Fresh off that game-winning kick from Mr. Eagle as the Falcons beat Pocosin. York will follow it up with a win over Parkview, the five seed. Hopewell, Norcom, that's a fascinating second-round matchup. Tempted to take Norcom. Very, very tempted to take Norcom in a rematch. I'll go hope well. They see Phoebus in the region final at Darling. And I'm going to stick with the defending state champs. Hope well to get through. But watch out. That second round game with Norcom really scares me potentially for Coach Irby's bunch even at home. Region 3B. This is a crapshoot, folks. Your guess is as good as mine. Nobody's got a better record than 6-4. and four. you got a winless team as a 7 seed. 
In the 1-8 game, give me Culpeper County over Armstrong, the 8 seed. In the 4-5 game, it's Brentsville District taking on Phillip Sims's John Marshall Justices in the playoffs for the first time in a long time. And give me Coach Sims's Justices to march on to the second round for John Marshall. I think it might end there. 3-6 game, TJ of Richmond taking on James Monroe, the 6 seed. The Yellow Jackets, 3-7. and seven. Coach Surbay's team known for winning. And this might be your region title game in the quarters, folks. I'm going to go with James Monroe to win that one. And Spotsylvania, the 2 seed, 6-4 and four, to eliminate the winless Bulldogs of George with. When the dust settles, I got the sixth seed. Yes, the sixth seed, James Monroe, marching on to the state semifinals at six and seven overall. Remember, they were seven and six last year, finished up at seven and seven. I got James Monroe beating Culpepper in the region title game. Region 3C, Heritage of Lynchburg's 9-1. They're the top seed. Spotswood's 9-1. They're the two seed, and you got Western Albemarle at 8-2. Brookville at 7-3, the four seed. I got all the higher seeds moving on as Heritage Lynchburg takes on Rustburg. Spotswood beats Liberty Bedford. Rockbridge County not enough to take down Western Albemarle and Fluvenna. The Flucos, who got off to a good start this year, I think they will lose to a Brookville team with some firepower led by Liberty Commit and Mike Glaze. Watch out for Brookville in the second round, but when all is said and done, I've got Jabari Blake and the Pioneers, Coach Brad Bradley's team, Beating Western Albemarle, Ed Redmond's team on the rise there. They've been known for being a tricky out. I got Heritage Lynchburg beating Western Albemarle in the regional championship after Thanksgiving. And in Region 3D, oh, this is one of my favorites right here. You heard from Coach Jamie Harless of Lord Botetot earlier. Northside is the one seed at 9 and 1, hosting the 8 seed Cave Spring at 2 and 8. Not your typical 8 seed. Yes, the record isn't good at 2 and 8. All said and done, Northside gets the win. 4-5 game, Magna Vista, not your typical 4-seed at 5-5. Five five. Yes, Coach Joe Favera's Warriors have had some injuries to deal with, even going back to the preseason. They'll beat a Tunstall team at 6-4 and four that is talented, but sometimes head-scratching. And the 3-6 game, Abingdon at 8-2. They'll bounce the 6-seed Hidden Valley at 3-7. and seven. Lord Botetot gets through Christiansburg, who's 2-8. and eight. We're going to get Chapter 3, folks. I do believe of Lord Botetot Northside. And give me LB, the Cavaliers of Lord Botetot, to win the rubber match with the Vikings. More to do here on the Virginia Preps podcast. Don't go anywhere. We got regions, or I'm sorry, class four, five, and six coming your way next. Back here on the VirginiaPreps.com podcast, we gave you the high school football 2018 playoff picks for classes 3, 2, and 1, starting with the lower enrollment, moving up to the higher enrollment. And we'll continue that as we proceed with the final segment on this November 8th day as the playoffs are set to get underway with Division 4, Region A. Oh, we got some interesting teams here. Beginning with Lafayette, the number one seed at 9-0. Andy Lynn's Rams have just been stellar all year long. Ground and pound, punishing rushing game. Excellent defense with Trey Kennedy at linebacker leading the way. Churchill at 5-5, five and five, improving under year two coach Dontrell Leonard. But I just don't see the Chuckers with enough in the tank to get it done in 48 minutes of game. I think this might be close for a quarter or a half. Ultimately, Lafayette, they're moving on. They'll get the winner of the 4-5 game. It's 7-3, Warhill. Five and five, Heritage the five seed. Ah, oh, George Massenburg, he's a live underdog with the Hurricanes. You know what, though? Warhill's got its mojo back, starting to run the ball again with Armand Fannin and Holmes. That's Noah Holmes, Holmes, running the ball. He was a sack master in the first meeting, and I think he'll be a more devastating weapon carrying the rock this time. Warhill gets it done against upset-minded Heritage. In the 3-6 game, it's Deep Creek 7-3 and three against number six seed Kings Fork 5-5. Five five. It was a 12-10 matchup. In the first game, where Deep Creek won on a field goal late by young Caden Dellinger. Hornets won't need heroics this time. I think they win by a couple of scores as Kings Fork is going in the wrong direction. They started out 5-1 uh, and one this year. They do have those two massive D tackles in Jerry Hardy and Trayshawn Mitchell. Just not enough in this one offensively against Deep Creek. And the two-seed, Lake Taylor, 9-1, and one, taking on the seven-seed, Smithfield, 5-5. Five and five. Lake Taylor, the only number two-seed in the state to beat three 9-1 football teams in the likes of Phoebus and Freedom and Maury. And they lost to Smithfield a year ago. Generally, Hank Slater's Titans team, they find a way to get revenge. They do so. And we're going to have that collision course. Lake Taylor Lafayette. Boy, I keep going back and forth in my brain. Who wins this? Lafayette has home field advantage. I'm not sure it's going to matter. 
I'm going to go with Lake Hiller. It's a battle-tested group. They know how to win those hard-fought games on the road. They did it against Phoebus, and I could see a similar scenario playing out where Lake Hiller's driving late with Malik Newton running the ball and Jeff Foster, at quarterback, to direct the Titans to victory. Moving on to Region 4B. I got Lake Hiller over Lafayette, by the way. I could change my mind come Thanksgiving, so ask me again when they actually meet. Uh, Region 4B, and I think they will meet. Region 4B, Louise is the one seed at 10-0. Oh, this is one of my favorite regions in the state, folks. You got four powers. Louise at 10-0. The two seed, Monacan at 8-2. The three seed, Dinwiddie at 9-1. And, and Eastern View, the four seed at 10-0. The four seed is 10-0, folks. And all four of those teams, excellent programs. They were 10-0 last year and got to the region semis at 11-0 and produced two whales of ball games. I think we get Louisa beating Huguenot the 8, Monakin the 2 beating Powhatan the 7, Dimory the 3 taking down Cortland the 6 in a Saturday game that's been moved to the weather as we know now, and Eastern View the 4 eliminating the 5 Midlothian. So who wins those semis and finals games? Well, I've got, moving on, Eastern View the 4 with quarterback Matt Lowry taking on Dimory the 3, Billy Mills' generals. So tempted to go Kyman, Petey Pope, and Dinwiddie. I'm going to go Eastern View as they get revenge for last year's close loss at Dinwiddie. The Cyclones, Craig Hatfield, no relation, folks, but I can justify it. A Hatfield's got to pick another Hatfield as the Cyclones move on to the state semis. Region 4C. They get it right here in Region 4C, folks. They go with six teams. You give the one and twos buys. Woodgrove the one at seven and two. Sharana the two at nine and one. Probably on a collision course, but watch out for the winner of these two games. We got really good three, six, four, five games. Kettle Run the three at nine and one. Millbrook the six at seven and three. You heard from Coach Charlie Porterfield on one of the most recent VirginiaPreps.com podcasts. His team has had a resurgent year on the rise, and Loudoun County Riverside played a great game earlier in the year. I took Riverside. It burned me. I think they get them this time, though, over Nick Parks and company. Watch me uh, end up regretting this pick again. Going to go with Riverside and Kettle Run. When the dust settles, give me Sharando, Hunter Entzminger, TJ Washington and company for Bill Hall's Warriors to beat Ben Castellano-led Woodgrove in the region title game. Over in Region 4D, Blacksburg is 10-0 on the season. Unbeaten, Liberty Christian Academy coming to town. Blacksburg will get the win at Christiansburg to move to 11-0. We'll see about the status of Tyquest Terry, who's been dinged up of late. The UVA commit wide receiver, a dazzling weapon for Grant Johnston and the Bruins there. The quarterback who slings it around for Blacksburg, one of the favorites to win the 4 a, or I should say, Class 4 crown. The 4-5 game, GW Danville at 8-2, Pulaski County at 7-3. Boy, there's some talent on the field in this one. I could give you 10, 15 minutes on this game. I'm going to go, though I think GW Danville's not playing its crispest. I'm going to go with the Eagles to get something going offensively and re recover a bit here and get the win over Pulaski. The 2-7, how about this one? William Bird is the 7 at 7-3. Seven we know about quarterback Sam Dantzler and the two-seed EC Glass with Drayshawn Kendrick and company. Give me the Hilltoppers. And in the 3-6 matchup, it's Salem at 7-3, Jefferson Forest at 7-3. This could be a shootout of a game. Bob Christmas's Jefferson Forest team led by Keenan Coopit in the backfield. Salem's got a guy that just had six touchdowns a couple games ago, I believe, in Isaiah Persinger running the ball. As year after year, Stephen Magenbauer Spartans, they get it done. Three-time defending state champs. They avoid getting knocked out in the first round in a whale of a game with Jefferson Forrest. So i got the top four seeds moving on. I'm going to go with EC Glass to end the dream of a four-peat for Salem in the second round. Blacksburg to get by GW Danville and the region semis. And in a bit of an upset, yeah, I'm going to go out on a limb here. A real limb. So I'm not sure of the health and effectiveness of Tyquest Terry. I'm going to go with EC Glass over Blacksburg. Give me the two seats. So give me a couple of, actually give me three two seats with Lake Taylor, Sharando, and EC Glass, as well as a four seed in Eastern View. So you know I'm just crazy as a fox if I'm not taking a single number one seed in Class 4. And there's some darn good one seats with Lafayette, Louisa, Woodgrove, and Blacksburg. Watch all four of them win and shut me up real fast. We move on to Class 5 now. Spent a lot of time on Class 4 there. Class 5 in the state. Indian River, a prohibited favorite in Region 5A. Glenwood Farabee's Braves, 10-0, beating Oscar Smith for the first time in 20 years. They'll have no problem with the 8th seed here in Norview, who's 3-7. and 
The 4-5 game in Class 5 Region A has some intrigue because I can guarantee you, I'll give you everything I own, that the Warriors will win that game between Nansman over the 4th seed and Kikatan the 5th seed. I'm going to go with the Nansman over Warriors, though, at home with Justin Conyers' his team having the better defense. The 2-7 is Salem at 8-2, Gloucester at 4-6. Give me Sean Wilson's Sun Devils to get the nod there. And Doreen McCain's Maury Commodore is at 9-1, taking on the... Number six seed, Warwick Raiders at 6-4, and four, who began 4-0 under Coach Corey Hairston this year. Maury, too many weapons with Alvante Lawton at quarterback, Keandre Lambert and all those wide receivers, plus the emerging C.J. Beasley. Maury moves on. In the 3-2 matchup, Maury, I got them beating Salem, and I got in the Rivers, Battle of Rivers, Indian River, avenging last year's second-round playoff loss to Nansman River. And in the region title game, after Turkey Day, Indian River continuing their quest for a state title. They will win Region 5A beating Maury. Region 5B, three-time defending state champs, the juggernaut, Highland Springs. Coach Lauren Johnson Springers, they take on the 8C deep run, who is no slouch. Highland Springs not going to have their season come crashing down in this one. The 4-5 is Atley at 7-3, Glen Allen at 8-2. Give me Atley at home. The 2-7, LC Bird at 8-2, Devils Freeman at 7-3. This, to me, has upset potential, but you go with Bird at home. Coach Troy Taylor, you're one at the helm. They'll be fine in this one, I think. Second round where it's going to be really tough because you have a tremendous, tremendous quarterfinal rematch of Henrico 8-1, the 3, Verina 8-2, the 6. Both had a loss to Highland Springs, somewhat competitive at times in those games. Verona came driving 99 yards to tie it against Henrico, missed the extra point. Henrico, Verina, it's a rematch. And boy, I tell you what. I think they're catching Verona at the wrong time. I'm going to go with Verona to spring the mild upset and beat Henrico at Chapel Stadium. Verona then takes down L.C. Bird. Highland Springs beats Atlee. And in the region championship, Highland Springs will cruise against their Capital District rival, Verona. The Springers and Indian River are going to meet December 1st in Chesapeake in what may be the most anticipated playoff game of this year until the state championships arrive. Region 5C, Broad runs the number one seed at 9-1. They take down number eight seed Thomas Edison, who's 3-7. and seven. The 4-5 game, it produces a really good one with 7-3 and three, Tuscarora and 5C John Champ at 6-4, and four, like what Champ is doing. But I think the Huskies, that playoff medal, they get it done at Fortune Field with Justin Allen at the controls of their attack. The two seed Stonebridge at eight and two, who lost a couple of games in the last month to Broad Run and Tuscarora, a couple of Potomac District rivals, don't see them getting knocked off by Jonathan Mulatu, led Robert E. Lee of Springfield, the future Villanova running back. I got Stonebridge moving on. Falls Church to three seed, and what a year DeQuandre Marshall has had, folks. He's been rushing like crazy, two thousand plus yards, six and four. The six seed Potomac Falls at five and five. Their defense will compete and make it tough on Falls Church. In the end, Falls Church gets the win. Can't see them taking down Stonebridge, so it sets up, in my eyes, a potential rematch of Stonebridge and Broad Run, although watch out for Tuscarora here. Stonebridge, Broad Run, who wins the rematch? And I'm going to go with, believe it or not, I'm going to go with Broad Run. I think Coach Griffiths and company have gotten things figured out against Stonebridge and Arch Nemesis, Mickey Thompson's Bulldogs, always a fixture. You got the player of the year at quarterback in Mitch Griffiths, Coach Matt Griffiths' son, and a great running back in Tim Baldwin, who just committed to Michigan. Uh, the QB in Griffiths is committed to Wake Forest. And the defense is underrated, very underrated for Broad Run, giving up less than 60 points on the year, just a little bit over 50. And they have some, some standouts all across the ball when you look at Luke Lindenfelder and uh, Mr. Dyson and some of those other contributors on defense. Region 5D. Massaponics, the one seed at nine and one. Albemarle, the eight seed at four and six. Jaquan Anderson is no longer there. If he was, this would be a really tight ball game. I'm going Massaponics to get it done. The four five game. Brook Point at six and four. Harrisonburg at six and four. Marcus Robinson Jenkins, you got a big effort for me, my man. I think he's going to get it done running the ball for Harrisonburg on the road at Brook Point. Give me Harrisonburg and eh, slight upset though. Four five is not much of an upset. The two seven is North Stafford at seven and two. Taking on Halifax County, the seventh seed at five and five. You got Chase McGowan, defensive player of the year in the Commonwealth there. You got Devin Ford, the electrifying running back, going to Penn State, the five star North Stafford. Give him the W. And the three seed Mountain View at six and four. Patrick Henry Roanoke at six and four as well. 
I've got Mountain View winning. Region final, North Stafford, the two. Massaponics, the one. A rematch. Massaponics won big. It'll be much, much, much closer this time. But I get the same result. Massaponics winning. So, all one seeds. All chalk. Indian River, Highland Springs, Broad Run, Massaponics. I'm no fun. I was fun in the first part of the segment. Not so much fun now. Let's see how fun I am for Class 6 as we close things out here on the podcast with Region 6A, 6B, 6C, and 6D. Ocean Lakes, not Oscar Smith, the one seed in Region 6A, but that's okay. Oscar Smith won it last year. has a three seed, beating Ocean Lakes on the road at the Sports Bucks of Virginia Beach, then beating Lanstown and a shutout in the region final at the Sports Plex in Virginia Beach. Ocean Lakes is the one at 10-0. They take out the 5 seed in Kellum. I'm sorry, the 8 seed in Kellum at 5-5. Five and five. The 4-5 game, this is a fascinating one. you got Cox at 8-2, Bayside at 6-4. and four. Will Tavion Robinson play? Will he? Won't he? The 4-star head to Virginia Tech. I say if he plays or doesn't he play, I think Bayside's got a great chance to get revenge for their season opening loss. Give me the Marlins in an upset. John White's team on the road. At their rival Cox. The 2-3, two, 2-7 two, game, excuse me, Oscar Smith, 9-1, Tallwood at 7 seed at 6-4. I love you, Tallwood. You gave me a t-shirt, some swag last week. I appreciate you. I think you'll battle hard and play hard. Oscar Smith's got too much for you, though. Tigers, march on. And in the 3-6 game, Woodside at 8-2 against Lanstown at 6-4. Tommy Riemann's Eagles are always dangerous, but Danny Dodson's Wolverines with that wing T. They run it and execute it. They win. Sets up Oscar Smith, Woodside, and Chesapeake, Ocean Lakes, Cox, and Virginia Beach. Dolphins, Tigers, top two seeds move on. And I'm going Oscar Frommel Smith, the Tigers, with Cam Kelly back. Had over 200 yards passing and four touchdowns. They're playoff veterans. They beat Ocean Lakes in a thriller in the region championship the day after Turkey Day in Virginia Beach. And Ocean Lakes has a good defense, by the way, led by Tank Land, the Maryland commit. They will come prepared and give them a battle. Xander Jellick has emerged at quarterback. I think that's the game where they miss Jake Lowe running the ball quite a bit against that tough Tigers defense. Region 6B, Manchester, they're number two in the state, and they're number two in the region at 10-0. The number one seed, Colonial Forge, gets the bye. I got Manchester taking out the number seven seed, James River of Midlothian, who's 3-7. and seven. I got the three seed in Thomasdale at 8-2, eliminating the number six seed in Cosby, who's 4-6. and six. They have Ethan West on defense, a prime prospect in 2020, and they gave Bird a scare. I don't see them giving Thomasdale quite the scare. And the 4-5 game is Franklin County at 6-4, and four, Clover Hill at 5-5. Five and five. The 5 seed flip a coin, heads Franklin County, tails Clover Hill. Uh, it's heads Franklin County. Region final, Manchester. They get by Dale, and I got Manchester taking down Colonial Forge, who I think feels a little slept on this year, a little disrespected, and they should. They have one of the most competitive, talented players in the state in Josh Surratt. I just have a hard time picking against a Manchester team with, in my opinion, the Gatorade State Player of the Year frontrunner and Brendan Clark, the quarterback headed to Notre Dame. He has been spotless when it comes to the touchdown-interception ratio. Manchester's my pick to win Region 6B and maybe go even deeper. Region 6C, Woodson, a surprising number one seed at 9-1. and one. Jared Van Acker in a year or two getting the Cavaliers on the right track. Taking on the 8 seed, James Robinson, the Rams at 6-4. and four. If there's an 8 that can beat a 1, and I don't mean this in any bad way, Coach Van Acker, your team's had a great year. This could be the one right here. Watch out for Robinson as an 8. They're not your typical 8 seed. They are a dangerous 8 seed. Um... I do think Woodson's defense comes ready to play and they get by Robinson in this game, but I will not be stunned out of my mind like some will be if an 8 beats a 1 in that matchup. Watch out there. I think ultimately Christian Yost and that Woodson defense will come ready to deliver a victory at home for the fans. What do I see with 4-5, 3-6, and 2-7? Well, I tell you what, 4-5... South County 6 and 4, Lake Braddock 7 and 3, the 5 seed. You know, Bronx Spalling, the freshman has emerged. Lake Braddock, you don't know what team's going to show up. One day they're great, one day they're not. I'm going to go with South County. I think a little bit more consistent right now at this time to beat Lake Braddock the 5 in a very hard game to call. The 2 7 is Freedom at 9 and 1, CD Hilton the 7 at 7 and 3. No rookie slayed this time. Remember, Hilton was a team that ended Freedom's hopes of a region and state title last year. Freedom gets revenge. They march on. And Hayfield, the number 3 seed at 9 and 1, taking on a very, very live 6 seed at 8 and 2, Mount Vernon. Give me Hayfield to get the victory in the post Brian Cobbs era. Region final, all said and done. I'm going to go with South County to beat Woodson in a surprise in the second round. Give me freedom. Let freedom ring. The Eagles 
Coach Overton's group with Taekwon Brown leading the way there at running back. Freedom to beat South County in the regional title game. And to finish it up at Region 60, and we save one of the very best for last. Why not? The Westfield Bulldogs, 10-0, the number one seed. They bounce the eight seed in York County, 6-4. Noah Kim, Eugene Asante, Taylor Morin, Bizette Woodley in that group. They're just playoff veterans. They know how to win championships. The 4-5 is George Marshall at 8-2. South Lakes at 8-2. The 5 seed. Having a better year than I anticipated, I'm going to go with George Marshall in a game that will call for double or triple overtime. Why not extra fun there? The 2-7, it's Centerville at 8-2. The 7, Stonewall Jackson of Manassas, led by the UVA commit and Chase Chalmers in the back end. Centerville, they've been shut out in two of their last three games. I think Chris Haddock's Wildcats will bounce back. The 3-6 is Madison at 8-2. The Warhawks. Playing some excellent defense. And Patriot, the six seed at 7-3. Much tougher draw for Madison is the three, who just beat Centerville. But nonetheless, even with Ja'Kai Moore, the offensive lineman stud for Patriot, I'm going to go with Madison to win that one in a hard-fought game. Second-round matchup with Madison-Centerville. Boy, that can go either way. I'm going to lead with Madison. Westfield beats George Marshall. And in the region championship, Westfield over Madison. They played a close one earlier this year, 17-15. So... Some one seeds there with uh, actually one one seed in Westfield. I go with a, a two in Manchester, a two in Oscar Smith, and a two in Freedom. A lot of twos. And that will do it for this VirginiaPreps.com podcast. We thank our guests for coming on. Rick Cormany of the Radford Bobcats basketball team, as well as Jamie Harless of the Lord Botetourt Cavaliers. We look forward to the rest of the playoffs. Enjoy your football weekend, and thanks for tuning in to VirginiaPreps.com. <laughs>